Hello and welcome back to Kung Fu Maintenance. Had a dishwasher leaking really bad underneath, flooded out, and uh, it's a good idea to unplug things to check around in here. I was just being real careful as I looked around to see what was going on. You might remember I had one where the uh, solenoid had rubbed against the drain hose, so I checked that first, but that wasn't it. Went ahead and ran the machine so I could see where it was leaking from. Well, it was coming from what looked like the pump and looking behind it. Now the culprit. Nice thing about the cell phone is I was able to peek in there further. Yep, there it is. It's uh, the back of the sump. Okay, got a unit I can possibly take the drain from. I pulled the seal down before, so it may be actually pretty easy to get in here. It's unplugged. And uh, all those things. Should be somewhat interesting. This one, I bought the vacuum with me in case I need it, but I think this one with the motor still down. I won't even need the vacuum. I'll need it for the next one though. So. There's the motor. That's great. So the, what I need for the other one is the housing. The housing is completely gone. Okay, here's our motor. 15 to 20 years working on dishwashers and this was the first time I ever needed to replace the sump. Now I was able to take the sump from this one as this one uh, doesn't get used so it was a nice uh, easy way to get some experience in, in doing it and change it out and see what was possible. Learned a few things so I want to pass those on to you. There's a screw in the front of this particular model of dishwasher that needs to be re removed first and then. So this deal has a tab that you got to pull on the back. This one, the tab's already out. Okay. And then two longer screws here. Just not sure how this is going to be sealed in. Got uh, GE coming for a warranty deal for another deal. But yeah, this is all. Let's see. Got this deal goes in, and then this is all one shot. But the question is, how is it sealed in? Oh, okay, just the gasket. There we go. Not too bad, actually. Look at that. No screws, no nothing, just it's like a three part gasket. So, not too bad. It looks like it just goes right through. Alright, we got it. So I can put that back in, and no one ever turn this unit on. And it looks like just this deal will come off here. So yeah, not all in all, not too bad. Look at that. I'm glad for that. that was pretty crazy. Stuff to get into. This should just slide right out. Oh, oh, oh. A little water. There we go, twist it out. A little tiny bit of water there. Oh, there's the gob stopper. Thought we might see that one. Okay, a little check, check ball. I'll leave that with this one. Okay, nice. There's what I needed. Crazy, huh? <laughs> Just keeping things interesting. Let's 
I'll be putting back under here. Pretty much taking everything from this unit. Except the gobstopper. Okay. This will go back in place. Oh gosh. Seated nice and flat. This is like the model TVs you know you'd see in a vacant staged unit. Just an empty shell. Looks good on the outside, empty on the inside. I'll need in there eventually. Yeah. Okay, got the dishwasher unplugged and removed the screw here that removed the anchor that holds the, the front of the motor and then I'll need to disconnect the motor, pu pull it on down. I'm going to speed up the film because you saw most of things involved uh, on the first clip of, of removing the, uh, the, sump, the sump and here's disconnecting the, the motor to pull it down. And this you just squeeze to pull the disconnect apart, but uh, I was able. There's actually enough room to uh, do it without disconnecting it, so I went ahead and did it that way. Of course there's a number of ways to do this, N none of them particularly easy. You, you could actually loosen the connections and, and pull just the sump apart and replace just the sump leaving the pump in place but there's not really much room in there. You also could disconnect the whole dishwasher, flip it on its back and change everything. Um, that involves unplugging it, disconnecting the power supply and then disconnecting the water supply line. So no way is exactly easy, um, but each way is possible. Um, this wound up proving to be about the best way for me, but I did, you know, again, I learned a few things in the process and, and one of them was um, when I put the sump back together, I kept wanting to check it and, and leak check it. Don't forget to put the gobstopper back in, um, but I kept wanting to um, leak check it and the thing is when you put the uh, inside the dishwasher when you put the tray back together 
it actually acts to to secure it and squeeze it together so that the gasket is held in place so um, so uh, you don't need to leak check it until you actually put everything back together um, the other thing is to be very careful as you're assembling things it's easier to assemble everything outside as I'm doing here uh, and then put it back in the last part going back in is the gasket itself for, for the sump the top portion of the sump that, that uh, puts up and through inside to the inside of the dishwasher that's about the easiest way to do it and again put in the bottom grate in the two screws that hold it in will will help you get it into place uh, much easier and then you just have to carefully leak dust it and put it all back together it's not not too bad but but it's bad enough you know one of those things um, fortunately this doesn't come up too often but I thought it'd be neat to show it here as it's something that I don't I haven't um, seen anybody else show and uh, wanted to share the journey and um, kind of add one more thing uh, that can come up with dishwashers. Uh, mistakes that get made is um, sl slipping the gasket on uh, the different connections that connect to the back of the pump. You just want to make sure that everything is is nice and in place. It can be um, a little tricky when you can't see it but pulling it out like I did here and putting everything together before putting the sump in last and the bottom portion of the pump in makes it not too bad. Yep, do be careful inside there. Everything is sharp. It's dirty. It's gross. It will cut you. You've got electricity. It's dangerous. It's a box of knives. But here it is. I'm pulling the gasket up and through and going around and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize that, um, you know, when you put the top grate in and everything, it, it pushes on the gasket and holds everything into place. So my big mistake here was trying to leak check everything as I'm pu pushing this gasket down and wondering how this thing is going to hold. And, and it's, again, actually, when you put the top grate back in, it holds it in place, and that's what keeps it from leaking. So don't bother leak checking it at this point until you put it back together and that'll save you a lot of the trouble that I went through that I didn't have to go through but figured it out so it's worth going through and worth figuring out. So there is the gasket in place. There it is. All set. But again, you want to put the grate uh, in place. I wound up trying to check it uh, and again, my, my big mistake here. <laughs> and wound up causing more leaking than I needed to experience. So you can see the water actually even started to drip through there. So yeah. But easy solution, putting the grate back in and, and uh, you know, tightening everything down like it's supposed to be. That's what holds it and makes the seal. So easy Which fix. I wound up needing to do another one a few days later. And one other thing that was kind of funny was uh, without the spray arm being put back in place and the, and the front section, it actually shot water straight through and right underneath the bottom of the front door. So water shot out that way as well. So a couple of lessons learned the hard way. So hopefully uh, you can take care of your dishwasher troubles the easy way. I showed you uh, kind of what I went through the hard way in the hopes that, that uh, you can know how to take care of your dishwasher. I was trying to tell you way. before all that was that, that that'll stay right there. And what happens is as you put the next pieces in, they will really act to hold it in. And especially with the tray. And yeah. So now we got to make sure we get the gobstopper in. I mentioned to you. Oh, sorry. And so it drops down in the hole. It's like, like a check valve. So that's in. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Only a little crazy. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So you see, as you tighten the, the two screws here, that's going to put pressure. Yeah. In. That's going to help to hold that gasket in. So one mistake I went in, which I think my friend was about to follow the same path that I followed last time, was really. I'm struggling with pushing it in because I didn't realize that once you put these in, that's really going to hold the whole thing like a sandwich. Yeah. It's going to hold the whole thing together. So, 
So, um, the mistake I ran into last time, I was trying to run the machine and make sure the sump wasn't leaking without this piece in. And so the water was going around <laughs> the outside of the sump. Yeah. And with this piece, long story short, acts to hold this this together. So. Tight. We're just gonna do the rest of the hands and over tighten it. So our sump's back in place, and now we've got our different pieces that go in. So this one, it's got it presses up the end. And over. Yeah, and this deal goes inside here. Like that. Okay. And this presses in. Sometimes this will pull out, so you just need to push it back in. It just presses in place, and then it's got one small screw on the front. This is one thing definitely to watch for when you're taking it apart. It's very easy to not realize that that little screw is there and, and break it. So before you start taking this apart, you know, you got to know that this got the front screw here and the back release clip here. Not my favorite design for sure. I like the older stuff. But it didn't have all this newer uh, check valves and all that, but you know, nothing wrong with it, it's a good thing, but uh, it's going to be a little annoying. Okay, so this just presses into place now that we already pulled the release. <laughs> yeah, that's locked in and I'll just show you again that back piece that you got to pull with a pair of pliers. And you can't pull it too hard or it will break off. We are ready to run and make sure we have no leaks, so we'll put the, the um, yeah, we can either put the, well, we can just run it like that. Uh, we'll have to plug it back in and just take a final look through and feel through. And, uh, looks like we're going to be good. Clamp up top. Yeah, we're going to begin. All right. Okay. We'll plug it in and check it out. Okay, we're ready to run and check it out. So, sorry. We lost the screw. Yeah. Did we, we, oh, okay, okay. I guess we could have taken it out and flipped it over, but, <laughs> you know, some other time I'll do it that way, just for the... Here goes the fill. Great. It's power, so we gotta be real careful. No touch anything. <laughs> Yeah, uh oh, okay. Let's see where it's from. Where it's from. Yeah, right. from our clamp up top here. So we just get up there and tighten that down. What I did was turned off the GFI right here. So it will have power to the from the box to the GFI but not further. So now I reset it. Fill cycle. I'm going to try again. Let's 
so far no drips. No drips, yeah. No. This is done. I'll hit that GFI again and then I'll wipe up the water from below. That'd be good. No more leaks? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now I'm going to advance it to the drain cycle. There it goes. Drain it out. No leaks. Our dishwasher is back in business. The sump is replaced. We're going to trip the GFI. Now I can wipe up all the water, but be aware it has power to this point and to this point. So that's it. Everything else further down and have no more power to. A little better to unplug it, but you know. Get it done real fast. Is it Friday yet? Nope, not yet. <laughs> Almost. It was nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll reset. Good. All fixed. All fixed. Okay. So I've titled this message, Do Not Be Deceived, which is critical. It's always critical. It's a critical time now, always critical. How does a person not be deceived? You have to know the truth. Jesus said uh, that you would know the truth and the truth would set you free. Anytime someone believes a lie, they're in bondage to that lie. They're tricked by the lie. This message I'm titling, Do Not Be Deceived, and it's something that's repeated over and over throughout Scripture, to not be deceived. Jesus used it to warn of people that would come in his name saying, I am Christ. And you can take that two ways. They could either be saying that they were Christ, or they could be saying that Jesus was Christ, but deceiving people even in what they were saying with the rest of their message. Um, there's nothing more critical about not being deceived than salvation, than how a person is saved. And so I wanted to address that here, is that salvation is the gift of God. It says that in Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's critical to know that salvation comes through the finished work of Jesus that he defeated sin and the grave, and he gives eternal life to those that receive it. Do not be deceived. So then we have throughout scripture, time and time again. And obviously there must be a lot to trip people up or trick people, lie to people and get them mixed up. Thing is, in Thessalonians we're warned that uh, the people perish because they did not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. It words it, you know, a bit differently, but, but the general idea is if you don't receive a love of the truth, then you're, you're not gonna know what the truth is. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So he is the truth. And to not be deceived, we must receive a love of the truth. Receive a love of Christ. Receive a love of the truth. And the way we're not deceived is to study the truth, to know the truth. You know, when people said before, to uh, identify counterfeits, you study the truth, you study the, the true thing, and that way you can identify what is a counterfeit. There's almost no place where this is more critical than it, when it comes to how a person is saved, because a person is saved by the finished work that Christ did on the cross, and it's the gift of salvation. In Galatians 2.21, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. 
You see, you can't have it both ways. It's either your good works and what you do, or it's the righteousness that comes through Christ. It's the gift. He took all of our sin on himself at the cross, and he gives his righteousness to those that believe on him. If you think that it's what you do, then it's likely that you're not saved. The only way to be saved is through the gift of salvation. And if you think that it, you maintain your salvation, you don't maintain your salvation through what you do. There's nothing we add. You know, what's begun in the Spirit is completed by the Spirit. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Um, it's not something that we maintain. It's something that he maintains. He holds us in his hand, and no one is able to pluck us out of his hand. You know, one, Once we've put our trust in him, we're sealed by his Holy Spirit. So if you haven't put your trust in him, I invite you to be reconciled to God, because this is why Jesus came to this earth is to reconcile us to God. He took every last sin, all of your sin, past, present, future, he took it on himself and nailed it to its to his cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Death is defeated. Sin is defeated. The enemy defeated. And now we can be raised with him in newness of life. And this is a constant process that God continually does in the life of a believer you're sealed once and for all but he is constantly renewing us and washing us with the water of his word it's him that makes us clean he makes us whole he makes us righteous he gives us his righteousness he gives us everything that we have the ability to forgive the ability to overcome the ability to live a righteous life the ability to offer our lives back to him, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to him. Because what he will do with our lives is so much better than what we would have done if left to our own inclinations. Now when you're born again, again, you're made righteous by him. Uh, it, when you do wrong things, you want to come back right away. Repent quickly, you know, and Repent now, believe in the Lord Jesus. Repent is turning from sin, turning towards God. And here is his love is manifest and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we could be reconciled to God. He's calling to each one of us to take a step closer. We're always able to draw closer, to draw near. And the Bible says the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's an awesome thing because Jesus is the shepherd of our souls. He guides us into green pastures, into better things, into things that make for a whole life, all the things that held you down, that robbed you, that you thought that were going to make you feel uh, satisfied in life that have turned out empty uh, the Lord leads us into a full life overflowing with joy and with peace peace like a river and love like a waterfall that washes over the believer and we have access to all the time to his presence his grace his love his power his wisdom, and we have everything that we need in Christ. Uh, he meets all of our needs. He, he guides us in the way that is needed. And we do go through hard things. It doesn't mean that your life is all of a sudden going to be easy because it isn't. You're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He has overcome the world, and he makes us more than overcomers through him that, that loved us, through his love through his presence, through his life. And soon he comes to, to take us to be with him. This life is temporary. The things we go through are temporary. The trials and the, and the tribulations that we experience, the pressure that you feel in life, is temporary. It'll pass. Trust in him. 
lean on him lean on don't trust in your own understanding lean on his truth he is the way the truth and the life but it's important to stay in the word and to continue to grow in the word Uh, and it's also good to get into a good church where you can get discipleship and have other brothers and believers but you want to get into a wholesome church into into a good uh, you know where the people are really seeking God and seeking the truth and growing um, because then you can grow and you can be bolstered up and there's discipleship and accountability and friendship and companionship so that you don't go through things alone but first things first is to know the Lord to receive what he has for you to, to ask him to save you and to lead you into all truth I hope that you do that today even now the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart One further thing I wanted to discuss is that Jesus is God and that he's a part of the Godhead for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's why he's able to give eternal life and that's why he's able to save. We're grafted into, through his cross, we're grafted into his eternal life. It's a gift. But uh, proof in the scriptures that Jesus is God is in John twenty twenty eight when Thomas, who was doubting Thomas, doubted doubted that Jesus had risen, he appeared to him in the room and Jesus told him to put your fingers and your hand in my side and you know, that he touched the wounds. And and uh that's where Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God you see he, he recognized he affirmed that Jesus is God. Jesus didn't rebuke him, say, No, I'm not God he is God. And other times in the scriptures, the disciples worship Jesus. Uh, that's something that you don't, you know, at any other time in the scripture where somebody goes to worship somebody that's not God, they're told not to. And um, that was something that the disciples did at certain points because Jesus is the word, the word of God and that part of God that, that he took away the sins of the world. Uh, in in another spot, Isaiah nine six. In Isaiah nine six, it was foretold who Jesus was in in this scripture, Isaiah nine six. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These scriptures, along with many others, demonstrate that Jesus is God, the part of the Godhead, that he came to earth and he uh, was crucified, buried, and rose again the third day. And when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit. He said that the, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, wouldn't come until he left. And and it, that is also demonstrating the part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three agree in one. Again, I invite you to call out to the Lord to put your trust in him for salvation, for he alone is able to save and to give you his righteousness. And this is how a person is saved, and that is the gospel. That no matter how far you are off or how bad you've been or how good you've been, that Jesus can make you righteous through his life. When he was speaking to the Jews, he he told them in John 2, uh, 20, John 2, 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Again, demonstrating that, that he's God because he's able to give his life as a ransom for the believers and he takes it again Uh, he raised from the dead it's by the power of God and God did it but it's him that did it because he is God he is the one who saves his name Jesus means God is salvation or Jehovah is salvation he came to seek and to save those that were lost Uh, Jesus said those that are are whole don't need a doctor but those that are sick 
That's really every single person that's ever been born, no matter how good they think that they are. Everyone has sinned. All have sinned and fallen short. Uh, and Jesus came to seek and to save those that were lost. That's every single person. It's the will of God that every man would be saved. So no matter who you are, uh, no matter what church you've been to, um, the Lord is calling. He wants to give you his righteousness. You must receive it as a gift. I invite you to call out to the Lord. Ask him to, shape, to save you, to put his righteousness to your account, to take all your sin on himself as he did at the cross, and put your trust in him and receive his salvation. And then ask him to guide you into all truth. If you've been part of any religious system that is going the wrong way, uh, you will definitely need to make some some hard choices and get yourself into the right place. You know, if uh, in, into a church that is seeking the truth and that teaches the truth, um, we can know the gospel in the Word. Uh, in Galatians, Paul warned us, uh, if anyone, even an angel from heaven, preaches any other gospel to you, let him be accursed. So if it's not the gospel, if you didn't read the Bible alone, the Old Testament and New Testament, and come to the knowledge of the truth, that's everything that you need to know for salvation and for truth is in the Bible. If it's a system that did not come, is not uh, directly from the Bible, you, you got to get out of there and away from there and get right to the word of God because uh, there are strong deceptions. All of these are coming from extra writings and extra things. Extra things that try to mix in works as a way to be saved and, and try to mix in, you know, all religion tries to work to be okay with God. You cannot be okay with God via your works. The only way you can be okay with God and have peace with God is through the sacrifice that he provided. Abraham, he said, God will pro provide himself a lamb. And Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father. It's through him that you can be saved by receiving it as a gift. No other way. Uh, there are the book of James talks about faith without works is dead. This is showing that if you have faith, obviously you're going to act upon that faith. It's going to show works, but no works of, uh, of righteousness that we do, uh, make us more saved or less saved. You're either saved by the gift or you're standing based on your own works and your own works. They, as someone said, they are a flat tire. They will not get you there. It's only through Jesus that you can be made right with God. Don't trust in anything else or any other religious system. Put your trust in the living God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Ooh. Mm -hmm.